Good morning, Interweb Warbler's Log 29. We are continuing to flesh out our planet here, placeholder name Kretak. We're on the road to getting our climate zones marked in with the topic of today's video being prevailing winds. But as always, before we crack into that, we got to do some follow up. Item number one, sea ice. So off air, I changed the shape of the sea ice here. This is it in Northern Hemisphere summer. And this is it in Northern Hemisphere winter, Southern Hemisphere winter, and Southern Hemisphere summer. I settled on these shapes thanks to personal correspondence with a hydrographer acquaintance of mine, Raul, if you're listening, thanks a million. So that said, these are not final. They may change, the, the sea ice may change depending on what the winds come out as. So still very much a work in progress. Point number two, this really weird seasonal gyre thing we discussed in the last episode. Thinking on it some more, I do think it's too small to actually exist. So I think this circulation pattern in this ocean will be present both in summer and winter. So this is it in Northern Hemisphere summer, and this is it in the winter. Still pretty cool though, because these sort of currents just don't exist on Earth. And item number three, final item, is I moved the ITCZ up a little bit here off camera. I had it ducking down to, I think about here, but I figured it's being dragged by the land here, or it's been dragged upwards by the land here and Simmery here, so I don't think it would dip down quite as much. Very minor tweak, doesn't really do much to the overall circulation. It just made me feel better. Okay, follow up done. Let's talk some prevailing winds. So previously we had looked at this kind of oversimplified model of how atmospheric circulation would work on an Earth-like planet. Real planets, not like this. Thanks in no small part to land. Land basically will screw up this really nice, neat pattern. So we're going to need to come up with a more kind of complex modeling system to more accurately gauge what the prevailing winds on our planets are doing. So let's give a quick overview as to how this kind of more complex model would work before we actually do it in a second. So we got our ITZZ already marked from previous videos. It was this kind of like wavy line looking thing that moved with the seasons. Cool. What we'll do today is we'll focus on our high pressure zones. So those are the areas around the subtropical high zone or the horse latitudes and up at the poles here. We'll place some circulation cells. Again, the exact location we'll discuss in a second, just giving a quick overview. In and around the subtropical high zone here. And we'll do the same at the poles. Again, recall that winds blow from areas of high pressure two areas of low pressure, as per our simplified chart here on the left. But because planets are spinning, the winds won't blow in straight lines, rather in spirals. In the northern hemisphere, they spiral in a clockwise direction. In the southern hemisphere, they'll spiral in an anti-clockwise direction, again due to the Coriolis force. And then really simply, all we're going to do is expand upon these so-called anticyclones, continuing to swirl out these winds until they come into contact with one another, and we've covered the whole planet in wind patterns. So something kind of like this. Something like this. Now recall, again, super important, winds flow from areas of, or blow from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Therefore, necessarily these cells are in conflict with one another. They can't flow into one another, otherwise you get winds going from high to high. So in those instances where these patterns meet, we're gonna end up creating low pressure zones. Same thing in the south. And also in the midlats, where these cyclones butt up against one another. And that's basically that. Mark in high pressure zones. And remember, high pressure zones tend to be pretty dry. Spiral out winds from these cells until they come into contact with one another. And when that happens, a low pressure front will be created. Low pressure, remember, relatively wet. And although this looks shock and messy, it kind of follows the same principles as this simplified diagram. So like in the polar cell here, winds are predominantly going this way, as they are here. In the temperate zone between 30 and 60 degrees, winds are predominantly going this way, 
again as they are here, in the tropics, predominantly going this way. Same shtick with the southern hemisphere. It's just we're incorporating a more kind of naturalistic flow pattern. All right, let's go put this into action. So I actually like to do a lot of this work in 2D just because I can see the whole planet at one time and then transfer it to 3D to check for errors. Just a me thing, your mileage might vary. So the first thing we want to do is place our subtropical highs. That is these mid-latitude circulation cells. To do that, I'm going to bring up my ocean currents map and I'm bringing it up for Northern Hemisphere summer. That's the season we're going to work on in this video. And the basic shtick here is that we're going to place a number of high pressure cells, subtropical highs, in our oceans, biasing them towards cold currents, because remember high pressure, relatively cool, dry, etc. In the summer hemisphere, we're going to center them at about 35 degrees of latitude. And in the winter hemisphere, we're going to center them at about 25 degrees of latitude. This chap is the summer hemisphere. Here's the equator. So that's 0, 10, 20, 30, 35. This is my cold current here, so I'm going to put a circulation cell here. Then we have 0, 10, 20, 30 is here. So it's a bit lower than I would like, but that's fine. Skewed it towards the cold current coast. So we'll drop it in somewhere here. 0, 10, 20, 30 to 35. Skewed towards the cold currents. Maybe somewhere here. And then 0, 10, 20, 30, 35 is in the middle here. So we'll put another one about here. Okay, that's the summer. Winter, 25 degrees. 0, 10, 20, 25, skew towards the cold current. 0, 10, 20, 25. 0, 10, 20, 25. And 0, 10, 20, 25 next to the cold current. So next we want to add high pressure zones to any winter hemisphere large land masses. The idea here is that land will heat up and cool down more rapidly than the oceans. So if you've got a big chunk of land in winter it's going to get very cold. Again cold high pressure. Without simulations of temperature here, this can this is very, very vague. So we just need to work on intuition. I'm immediately drawn to this kind of rather substantial peninsula here. I can imagine it would get very cold. So the basic shtick here would be to place a circulation cell somewhere roughly in the middle, skewed towards any particularly cold regions. So I'm just, you know, intuition is telling me possibly here somewhere. There's some cold current stuff going on here, but also on the other side over here. So I'm thinking just bang in the middle, maybe somewhere, maybe somewhere there. And these can be further poleward than your subtropical high zone cells. Now we have high zones, as mentioned previously, at the poles, but we will save these for when we're in Blender in 3D, just to avoid distortion issues. Just make a mental note, something's going on here, something's going on here. Oh, and I guess we could also have some sort of high here, but again, I'm reluctant to include this. It's not as sizable as this area over here. It's flanked by a bunch of warm currents. There's no particularly high mountains within this little jut of land that would make this area more cold relative to areas at, at a similar latitude. So I'm inclined to say for now, nothing here. So next we're going to mark in our anti-cyclones, which is the directionality that the winds are going to spiral out at. So something like this. Gravy. Now let's turn off these ocean currents. We don't need them anymore. Makes things a little bit cleaner. So next we're going to mark in our trade winds or our tropical easterlies. That is these fellers here. For the most part, actually, they, they do kind of stick to this simplified diagram, originating from our high pressure cells, our subtropical highs, and flowing into the ITCZ in a sort of westward direction. So I think the best way of explaining this is to literally just do it first and then I'll, I'll explain why I did the things I did. So we'll start in the Northern Hemisphere and we will do something like this. So 
So the basic shtick is I'm trying to keep this kind of spiral in mind. I start on the eastern edge, bring out a wind pattern in accordance with spiral, and then bring it back around to meet the ITCZ. Because again, in the tropics, the wind should be predominantly flowing to the west. And then I do that a couple of more times, again, trying to keep the spiral in mind. And also important to note that I'm feeding them into the ITZZ, not the equator. That's really important. And the same pattern basically holds for each of the cells. I've left gaps, we'll talk about those in a second. Now let's do the same for the winter hemisphere. There's a slight hitch here. In that, you'll notice that the ITZZ is entirely in the northern hemisphere. So that means as winds spiral out from these cyclones, when they cross the equator, the Coriolis force is going to switch, so those winds are going to quite severely change direction. So for example, something like if there's a wind being thrown out this way, it's going to come along like this, meet the equator, and then switch into the ITZZ. Same thing like over here, winds be thrown out on this side here, curl around, go west, meet the equator, switch. Other than that, it's the same process as above. Cool, and we can also have our kind of more poleward subtropical high zones do the same sort of shtick. So again, wind spirals out, and then it'll come back around and switch. Now, for the gaps, at least for me, thinking in terms of these kind of spirals, eventually stops kind of making sense in terms of feeding winds into the ITCZ, at least at this stage. So what I like to do then is just starting on the western side of these anticyclones, of these high pressure cells, I just run basically a series of winds parallel to the ones I've already established. So for example, I might do something like, say center of the cyclone, I might do something like this. Same thing here, for example, center of the cyclone roughly say, I might do something like this. All provisional, it could well change once we get onto mapping on the globe and moving stuff around and making better sense of this. This is kind of very much a, um, a sort of an initial sketch. Maybe something like that. Now, it wasn't really relevant kind of at all here, but there's an important point about mountains. So imagine we had two mountain ranges. Let's say we had one like this running more or less north-south, and then one that's running at more of an angle, say something like that. In this instance here, if we had the winds coming in, spiraling in like this, and they meet roughly perpendicularly, there won't be too much of effect. Basically a whole bunch of air is gonna build up here and then flow over the mountain range like so. If however, the wind comes in at more of a shallow angle with respect to the mountain range, the wind can kind of like be deviated by the mountain range like so. World Building Pasta actually has a wonderful analogy on his blog. Imagine putting like a block of wood in a stream. If it's perpendicular to the stream, or to the flow of the stream, the water will just build up behind the block of wood and flow over it, continuing on its merry way. If, however, the block of wood was placed at a shallow angle with respect to the flow of the stream, the stream would just kind of like split around it. So, so yeah, mountain ranges can kind of change the course of these winds. But again, on my map, I was trying to look out for it. Most of the time, I'm kind of hitting most of these mountain ranges relatively parallel. So not much has gone on here. I mean, there's a little bit here, but it's kind of, this wind is already kind of like ducking under the mountain range as is. So just a thing to keep an eye on. So next we are going to complete these subtropical highs. And that's just a simple case of continuing to spiral out the winds. So again, if we start with this chap here, again, I'm keeping in mind this broad sort of spiral. So let's say a wind goes here, around like this, around like this, around like this continue this way, something like that. Start small, move on to the next one, and then we'll keep expanding as we iterate. So same thing here, I'll go like 
that perhaps here here and while you're doing this what you want to do is you want to kind of keep these biased towards east west movement like don't have spirals that go like you know north south that's not how these things work keep them kind of i guess elliptical along this sort of axis or axis rather so same thing over here we do something like this something like that And every so often as you're doing this, you'd be like, oh wait, hold on, this makes total sense to run another wind like this into the ITTZ. ITZZ. Oh my God, that's so difficult. ITCZ. <laughs> okay, something like that. And then I'm just gonna keep going and expanding these outwards and leaving a little bit of room between where they meet because we're going to draw those fronts in in a second. And also the uh, polar front lies between about 60 and 70 degrees. I'm deliberately crossing that here. Again, in 3D, we'll work on the poles. So I'm just leaving myself a lot of error room, basically. Okay, so for a rough sketch, again, we'll improve upon it in Blender. This is good enough. Next, we're going to put in where the boundaries between these different patterns are. So for example, here, all this wind is coming along like this, and it's going to run into the back of all of this wind. So we're going to have a front created like up along here. Same jazz here. This is all coming around like so and running into the back of this. So again, we're going to have something. And in fact, I might actually just bring it like this. Same thing here. This wind is coming along like so. Running into the back of this. So I think we'll have something like this, perhaps. Potato, potato, complete the map. Okay, front marked in. Now, so the thing here, there's a bit of a knack to this. You kind of need to think about where these fronts will go when you're drawing these wind patterns. And this is just really a matter of practice because in general, these fronts should appear between subtropical highs, but biased towards the one in the West. And in general, there should be a more equator word in the West and more pole word in the East. So you have this kind of a slant thing going on. So I was thinking about this as I was drawing in these spirals. Now, admittedly, this is almost too prototypical. Like it's it's just way too regular. So I think maybe it might be an off camera job. I may actually want to, for the sake of interest, put in another high pressure zone here. So we'll end up with a whole bunch of like messy fronts happening here. But we'll see. For now, I think this is a good kind of demonstration thing. Here it is in its sort of cleanest form. Okay, and with that, we're about ready to export this into Blender. But one thing I should have done earlier is I should have made these winds here a really bright color. So I'm just going to select all of them and I'm going to change them to like a, a hot yellow just so they stand out more and I'm not drawing black on black in Blender. Okay, now we're going to save this as a transparent PNG. So we'll take off all the stuff we don't need. There we go, just that. And we pop back into Blender then. And what I've done here is I've set up a winds template layer. If you don't know how to set up these kind of pseudo layers in Blender, I'll leave a link in the usual places to a how to on that. And I've uploaded that PNG we just exported into this layer. So if I make it visible, we get this boy -o. delightful. So then I'm gonna turn on my summer wind patterns because that's what we are doing and make sure summer wind patterns is selected here in the draw menu. This is the screwdriver and spanner thing on the right here. And all I'm gonna do now is just basically trace over what we got, putting in some arrows to show directionality because this was only a loose sketch. We're gonna do the proper one now. Okay, and I think really all we should do now is just one big giant time-lapse. So I guess I'll see you in a few minutes.
Okay, so there's already a couple of things there. Uh, just this made more sense to me, this circulation pattern here. And it's kind of what I talked about earlier with the mountains. This came along here and I'm kind of like, oh, it's it's like flowing parallel to the mountains. So it's kind of going to go around the mountains like so and in. And then a similar thing here, I imagine this coming over hits this mountain range fairly perpendicularly. So it's just going to continue over, but then according to the spiral, it's going to drop down. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of dropping down in between these two mountains. So it's being corralled by it. And so that's where we get this kind of weird looking shape from it. Similarly, some of the patterns here in 3D just make more sense to me. So again, continuing down the spiral. And here, you know, limitations of the 2D page. This is where the edge of the page was. I'm going to just complete this spiral in 3D and we'll see how it meshes with this here. So initially I'm thinking perhaps this. All right, onwards. Okay, welcome back. Um, this bio here gave me some issues, again, largely because there was the cut in the page, but I think I got him worked out now. He looks fairly decent to me, okay? So what I deliberately did was I stopped all of these patterns in around 60. So we have lots of room for our polar cell to operate and we will expand upon these continuing to follow the guidelines if we so need them. So let's do that. Let's take an orange color and let's create a high pressure zone just on the pole because this would be the coldest part here. And then in the south. So in the south, it's interesting. Here is the pole, but we have this the, all this like high land just equator or two it so i actually imagine that the coldest part here would in fact be this elevated plateau 
So I'm going to just skew it towards that. And also it's the winter hemisphere here. So I'm just going to make this slightly bigger to remind myself that this is more intense than what's going on in the north. So I think that's okay. Let's mark in those wind patterns. So we're in the northern hemisphere. This goes clockwise. Is it the correct direction? Yeah, that's the correct direction. And then we go down to the winter hemisphere and this goes counterclockwise. I am 100% going to mess up the directions of these at least once. So uh, someone keep an eye on me here and let me know in comments. Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. Sure. Okay, cool. The polar front lies between about 60 and 70 degrees north and south. In the summer, it is closer to the poles, so closer to 70. In the winter, it is further away from the poles, so closer to 60. So we are currently in the summer hemisphere here. So I'm going to go, yeah, around about this dotted line. So again, I'm just going to spiral out, completing the spiral. Something like that. Now, admittedly, these polar easterlies are not exactly the most regular winds in the world or the strongest. And the polar front is, again, like hardly the most regular structure in the world. But we're kind of oversimplifying here just so we can complete the like global circulation pattern. So I'll do the same in the south. This time going more towards 60 because we are in the winter in the south. And I'll keep this one in here, so I'll just not go as far down as 60, just, just because. Okay, done. Now what we got to do is just basically go back to our guidelines and see can we complete things. If there's any gaps between our winds we derive from the guidelines and the winds that we put in here in Blender. Not really much to explain here, so I guess sit back and uh, enjoy another time lapse. Okay, and final thing we need to do is we need to just basically trace the high pressure zones here and the fronts here. I won't do this in time lapse because there's, you know, there's nothing else that I need to figure out. The important part has already been done. So uh, through the magic of editing, it should all look like this. Excellent. Northern hemisphere, summer, prevailing wind patterns, done. And what you would do now is complete the exact same process but for half a year later. In classic cooking show fashion, here's one I prepared earlier. So here we are in Northern Hemisphere winter, following the exact same guidelines as outlined previously in the video. Here's summer, winter, summer, winter. And in 2D, Northern Hemisphere summer, Northern Hemisphere winter. Summer, winter, summer, winter. And here they are side by side. Oh, crap. It was all going too well. I just realized there was a thing I meant to say in follow-up that I totally forgot about. Um, just to throw it in here real fast. Recall I had said Enzo events would occur in this ocean, El Nino Sudden Oscillation. See previous video for more details. Again, in correspondence with my hydrographer acquaintance, shout out Raul. He advised me not to put it here, in this ocean. It's too small. So it turns out my initial gut reaction was correct. These oceans here are where the Enzo vents will occur. So just change that up. Anyhow, that is, I think, that. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you join me in the next one where I think we're going to be talking about upwelling, coral reefs, fishing, all that sort of jazz. Thanks for watching, folks. Love y'all. Until next time, Edgar out.